So it is my great pleasure and a sincere honor to welcome to the stage someone who I know is going to thrill you and entertain you with his tales about how the internet has changed emergencies. I need a very, very loud EMF welcome for Ben Proctor. Thank you. Can you hear me? Oh, that's, that's very exciting. Um, yes, thank you all for coming. And I don't just mean, oh, it's not working. I don't just mean to this event. I mean to Herefordshire, where I was born and bred, which means I've probably got the record for having traveled the least distance to come to EMF camp. Um, so um, this is me. Um, you know how it is. You submit a talk, and you think that's great. And then you think, just as the talk approaches, you think, how arrogant is it that I can explain to you how the internet has changed emergencies? And so this is my, way, this is my defense. So this is like my perspective. So I'm basically a general purpose data geek. Um, I've been a volunteer for a weird um, internet thing that helps out in emergencies called the Standby Task Force for a long time. Um, I used to be an emergency planner in the uh, um, public sector in the UK. And I also have a sideline training emergency planners in this stuff. So that's, um, that's where I'm coming from on all this. Um, you may or may not be familiar with the profession of emergency planners. Um, Emergency planners are kind of born, not made. And there's a way to test whether you are born to be an emergency planner. So what I need you to do is just imagine you're walking down a street that you know very well, and suddenly there is a huge explosion in front of you. And in that moment of seeing that explosion, you make a decision. And, and we, we're not going to ask you what it is, but some people make a decision to run towards the explosion, and some people make a decision to run away from the explosion, and either of those people should not become emergency planners. If in that moment you think, we're going to need a lot of ambulances, where are they going to park? <laughs> you should become an emergency planner. Um, so very briefly, um, you've all come to a talk uh, about how the internet has changed emergencies. Um, we should probably explain what an emergency is. Um, because we're in the UK, we have um, the great honor of having the definition of emergency enshrined in law. Um, so uh, it's... Basically, it's what you would imagine an, uh, uh, an emergency to be. It's something that threatens, uh, seriously threatens life or the environment or the security of the state. And um, I'm going to be randomly moving between kind of global international disasters and local UK emergencies um, in a way that doesn't necessarily make coherent sense, but I've got the microphone, and so you can't really stop me. Um, so... There are, only, there are three things I think it boils down to um, where the internet has really made a huge impact. And the first one is about maps. So um, I kind of wish that I'd just done my presentation about maps because I have so much to say about how important and transformative mapping has been in uh, humanitarian work that um, I'm going to run out of time. But um, the kind of story of maps for me, it starts back in 2010, where a uh, very large earthquake hit Haiti and, um, and devastated uh, most of Port-au-Prince, the, the capital city. And it happened at a, um, a kind of crucial time for a number of things in the internet. Um, so we had the internet, which was a good start. We also had a system called OpenStreetMap. Hands up if you are familiar with OpenStreetMap. Almost everybody, that's great. Um, so that's a wiki for maps, which was started in 2004, and it, its original intention was to provide a license-free alternative to state mapping, which was usually locked up and expensive. But very quickly, people who got involved in that said, well, this could be really useful in like, emergency response humanitarian uh, work. So there, would all, there, would, there had been a, a long drive to make use of it. Um, uh, but then... Um, and, they, and, and there had been OpenStreetMap um, kind of deployments around humanitarian stuff before this point. What was really different here, I think, was this was very uh, significantly reported in America. So um, for all sorts of reasons, um, this, this got a lot of um, attention in the US. And so you, you have now um, uh, OpenStreetMap, which is kind of available and, and ready to be used for... Um, uh, for, for, for mapping in, in disaster zones. And then you have Americans who have a lot of data that could be useful for suddenly paying attention to what's going on in, in Haiti. So um, these people are search and rescue teams. Um, after an earthquake, one of the first things that happens 
is search and rescue teams from around the world uh, get on planes and they just fly into the area. Um, and at this point, when they fly into Port-au-Prince, um, it's in Haiti, which is incredibly poorly mapped. The developing the developed world is incredibly poorly mapped. So it's not necessarily that big a deal, because if there's a collapsed building, you can go and start digging in it. But how do you know whether you're digging in the right place? How do you coordinate with a load of other teams, all of whom are from outside of Haiti and don't know the names of the streets? Or So maps are a, a really crucial way to, to communicate. But like I say, Haiti, very poorly mapped. Um, but because um, the Port-au-Prince earthquake... <coughs> I've got a clicker, but it doesn't seem to be clicking. Um, uh, sort of caught the attention of, um, I think, a lot of Americans. Um, there was a sudden explosion around the world of people uh, saying, let's get on to OpenStreetMap and let's start building a map on the fly so that people have uh, some data there. And so you, you had these uh, crisis camps um, often in universities, they happen around the world. Um, at the time, I think we, we, we were really proud that there, there may have been a thousand people involved in, uh, in, in this sort of mapping action, which seemed, uh, like in 2010, that seemed like, wow, how many people, like now, oh, the OpenStreetMap community can mobilize that, that sort of number just like that. Um, and then what you got on the ground was, um, over the course of days, that's, 10th of January, that's, that's basically what appeared on OpenStreetMap, and Google Maps was very similar. And then by 12th of January, you started to get that more. And then by the 5th of February, you get like proper, hard, really, really high quality mapping. And um, there were some other things, like it's not just OpenStreetMap, there's, a, there's a, a long standing group called Map Action who actually fly into disaster zones and start to generate maps for people. It's like having the uh, the mapping data in the internet isn't sufficient. You need to get it into the hands of people um, on the ground. Um, but really, from this point, I think the, the humanitarian world woke up to the fact that there was this amazing source of data. And, and they, started to, um, they started to make a lot more use of it, demand a lot more. So this was um, uh, Typhoon Haiyan, which was um, one of a couple of ty typhoons that threatened the Philippines in short order. And these are... Uh, each of these squares is a change set, so it's basically an edit that's been made to the map. These were edits that were made in the, the days leading up to Haiyan hitting the Philippines. And by 2013, this had become kind of a normal response of the OpenStreetMap community that where a hurricane or a, or a disaster threatened, they would get online and they would start building a map so that they didn't have to do it after the fact. They could do it. It would be there available um, from that moment. But even then... That's a kind of limited value because um, you're still doing it at the last minute. You're, you're remote. You don't, you, you don't know what the names of the streets are from a satellite. You can see that there is a street, but you don't know what it's called. Um, and so it's this, um, the community has now moved into this um, really excellent project. And if you've got any interest in this area, helping out with missing maps is like the best thing you could do. And essentially, um, uh, it started with British Red Cross, American Red Cross, and Médecins Sans Frontiers. Um, and they've identified high-risk areas that are poorly mapped, and they're encouraging the community to get out there and map them uh, early, but they partner with, 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 with people on the ground, which is partly for practical reasons, so like, people on the ground can go around and, and, tell, you, and, and, and tell you what buildings are called, where, what, what the names of streets are, but also um, it, it's, it's, um, uh, the, the, there's a potential ethical problem with a load of people sitting in the West with satellites paid for by the West creating maps of other people's countries. And so the more we can do to kind of engage the people on the ground, the better. So Missing Maps is a great, um, is a great project. And, and now um, OpenStreetMap really is the, the, the best mapping for much of the world. So um, this is a city in Tanzania. There's no, I, I, I don't know anything about Tanzania. I just thought I'd, I'd pick a city. You'll see that Google Maps actually has you know, a reasonable amount of data about that city, but there's a lot more granular data in OpenStreetMap. And that's, that's pretty common um, wherever you go across the world. Um, and this is the, roughly the same view um, in two different renders. So one of the beautiful things about OpenStreetMap is you get hold of the actual data so you can create your own maps for your own purposes. So the bottom is the standard map, which you would just see on OpenStreetMap. The top right-hand corner is 
a humanitarian map, so it's designed for use in disaster response. So you'll see that there are different buildings show up, so pharmacies show up in the humanitarian map, where they don't show up in the, uh, the, the standard map. Um, the colors are designed to um, uh, reduce, use less printer ink when you print them out, and also to enable you to annotate on top of them. And, um, and search and rescue is kind of where it came from and is the most um, dramatic use of this. But I've heard people from Médecins Sans Frontières say um, OpenStreetMap has saved countless, genuinely countless lives for things like cholera control. Because when people come into a clinic and they have cholera, you need to find out where they're from. And if you haven't got a map, you don't, you, you, they'll say, I'm from that village over there. If someone else comes in and says they're from a different village, is that just a different name of the same village? Is it in the same place? Is it downstream? Without a map, tracing things like cholera outbreaks is incredibly difficult. With a map, it gets a lot easier. Um, I put this in just to show that it's not just maps. Um, so, um, despite my enthusiasm for um, humanitarian open street map team, I volunteer for a different group, and we, uh, we essentially try and put data on top of the maps that OpenStreetMap have built. Um, this was uh, a project we ran with the World Bank in um, 2015 after TC Pam had hit Vanuatu. Um, Vanuatu is a really remote set of Pacific Islands, essentially, and tropical cyclone went through several of the islands and did an awful lot of damage. One of the things I did not know about international humanitarian response is um, the first people in and, and tends to be the fundraisers. So there isn't a big pot of international money sitting around for international, certainly for places like Vanuatu. Um, so the first people in go in to, to, to do undertakings to assess the need for money so that they can go to uh, public, uh, global donors and ask for money to go and uh, fix that. And so one of the things they, that is commonly is done is a rapid damage assessment. So you go in and you work out which buildings are totally damaged, which buildings are partially damaged, so you get some idea of how many people are homeless and how much it's going to cost to rebuild. That takes, that's rapid damage assessment takes six, eight weeks, typically. In Vanuatu, it takes a lot longer because it's a long time to get there. So as an experiment, we, um, uh, the World Bank paid some drone pilots to go and overfly the area. And they took side-on images and they took top-down images. And the top-down images we gave to OpenStreetMap. And the side-on images we tagged. We got volunteers on the internet to tag um, every building. And so red tags are total damage, amber tags are partial damage, and blue tags are not significantly damaged. That was the most tedious. It was just in the, in the terrible uh, balance point between you had to have meticulous attention to detail but it's incredibly repetitive. But, um, but it, 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 it meant that we could do a rapid damage assessment um, in about a week, and most of that was getting drone pilots onto Vanuatu and then getting the data out so that we could see it, because Vanuatu is not well connected to the internet. Um, and and there's, now, there's been quite a lot of work to try, and to, to try and build machine learning into this sort of tool, and I've seen some experiments in the, the Houston floods where I don't know if they were used by the, by the agencies, but there certainly people were using this sort of approach, but with machine learning applied to it, uh, to do rapid damage assessment. Uh, so maps. Maps are a big positive that the internet has had. Um, uh, the second really big impact, I think, is um, citizen self-organizing. So um, uh, UNHCR, um, do uh, quite a lot, so United Nations High Commission for Refugees, they do quite a lot of work um, trying to understand the needs of refugees and internally displaced people. One of the things they say is um, that um, amongst the most asked questions when people present at refugee camps and IDP camps is, do you have Wi-Fi? And uh, is there someone to charge my mobile phone? And where do I get a SIM card? Um, and those are typically asked before, do you have food and water? Um, so the, the degree to which can, being connected is kind of now fundamental to human beings. Not, not kind of just, uh, it's great, you know, I don't need to tell you, we have Ethernet to our tents. But the, the degree to which connections um, are kind of fundamental to the way people think about the world. And if you imagine the reason that you want this is you need to find out whether your family is safe, you need to tell them that you are safe, you need to talk to your 
friend, like you, that everybody that you know is on the internet. Um, and so this has had um, a couple of kind of significant consequences. Uh, so one is that almost without noticing it, um, communications infrastructure has become a critical, a, a critical part of um, emergencies, disaster recovery, and a lot of it was never designed for that. So the, the cell network is a, is a good example. Like the, the, the cell network was designed originally to, I'm looking at someone who knows a lot about this, so I'm hoping that he's nodding. The cell network certainly um, in, uh, in the West was designed to be um, like a, an add-on to the critical infrastructure, which was the fixed line network. Well, actually, the cell network is a, criti is a piece of critical infrastructure. Um, and you've seen that, um, you've, you've started to see that shift happen and certainly uh, in kind of, to switch back to UK emergency planning, when I became an emergency planner in 20, 2005, um, the 999 service going down was the thing that we had, that was the communications risk we had in our plans. Now, the mobile service going down, the internet going down, those are much more, that, 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 those have appeared in our risk registers in a way that they, we never thought of them um, before. Um, and then, Critically, because human beings are incredibly connected and they have these tools and techniques that enable them to talk to their friends and family, uh, it turns out they use them uh, to self-organize. So um, I've got a couple of examples. So this is um, 2013 in Aberystwyth, which is in uh, Midwest Wales. Um, they had a, a huge and um, not, not really expected flooding event. Um, and it affected not just Aberystwyth, it affected some... Uh, some villages up upstream, and it and it really was quite kind of dramatic, um, and it um, thankfully I don't think it caused any deaths directly, but it made an awful lot of people homeless straight away, and um, and without really the uh, the official authorities being aware, the people of Aberystwyth um, started to decide that they were going to sort stuff out. They were going to offer like you see this a lot. People offer uh, temporary accommodation to each other. They um, they offer Wi-Fi, they offer power, they, they, um, and, and what's kind of worrying from the, um, the this kind of state responder point of view is um, how, much, how much faith can we have in these people? Like, the, how safe are you going to the house of, as a friend of a friend of a friend on Facebook? Um, would, you, would you not be better going to the leisure center and keeping, it, uh, keeping on a camp bed, which is the thing we have in the plan for you. Um, and that's actually no longer a relevant question because it turns out this is just what happened. Like this is, so so the, the question has shifted from 2013 where Herodigian Council were going, is this right? Is this safe? Should what, like, what, like to, we need to give people sensible advice because this is the way that people respond to emergencies. And I'm kind of, I find it quite sort of, um, uh, kind of life-affirming, like almost always in emergencies, disasters, human beings in large numbers go and help each other out. And they, um, when they do it on the internet, you can see it, but they do it anyway. Um, um, this is uh, perhaps a slightly more significant thing. So um, in the Nepal earthquake, um, there was a fantastic organization called Kathmandu Living Labs um, they were part of the OpenStreetMap community, so they were, uh, they were mapping Nepal um, locally as, um, on OpenStreetMap because they could see that it would be useful. And because they were there and doing that, um, when the earthquake struck, they suddenly kind of turned into this hub for um, community action. And they used this tool, which is used a lot, even though it's horrible, um, called Ushahidi. So Ushahidi was originally developed for election monitoring or post-election violence monitoring. Um, and actually, I don't, I, I don't think it's a great, got a great UI, but lots of people know how to use it. It's free, and what it enables you to do is take public reports on a map. So um, uh, one that we worked on in Nepal, um, there was an orphanage full of 50 children, and they're not there anymore. Does anyone know where they are? Is a thing that you can put on a map, and then you can track comments and workflow against that report, and then someone can close it down. So say that that's been resolved. And Kathmandu Living Labs um, set up a Nushahidi instance. This was towards the kind of end of that deployment. So where it says 1,015, that's 1,015 reports of something that needs attention. Um, and then with almost all of those, there was 
uh, a response and triaging. And this is all happening at a kind of citizen to citizen level. Um, the, the state and to a large extent the kind of the humanitarian responders who go into disaster zones um, weren't really engaging with that. So, so part of what my volunteer group do is to try and help humanitarian responders understand that you, this, this is a significant thing. Um, but again, I think this is um, because uh, like Aberystwyth is in the West and it's nice and rich and it's not totally surprising that people go onto Facebook and they try and help each other out. Nepal is not rich um, and yet um, they, they use this kind of, um, these free but kind of cutting edge bits of technology to self-organize kind of significant humanitarian response. Um, and then within, uh, within the world of disaster response, there's a whole kind of set of layers of citizens who are just getting on with it to different degrees. So my group, Standby Task Force, is um, just a group of people, essentially we're emergency on-call librarians, like we're people who like searching the internet for things and putting it on maps. Um, but there's a, whole, there's a whole kind of swathe of them, um, and they, they have kind of sprung up out of people like yourselves um, who have skills and are motivated to do something about it. Um, and uh, rather like the Kathmandu Living Labs problem, the kind of the people who expect to be doing something about it aren't, don't really know what to do with these weirdos who appear on the internet and start. And so, so the, the UN has set up a thing called the DHN, the D Digital Humanitarian Network, to try and provide an interface between the weird, we call them VTCs, volunteer technical communities, but these kind of weird, amorphous, citizen-led, self-starting technical groups who actually have high levels of capability, but don't know anything about humanitarian response, and the people who are on the ground trying to kind of install clean water and all that stuff. And so um, if, you, if you're inspired to do any of this stuff, find yourself a DHN group and, um, and join it. Um, and um, we've, we've seen this um, citizen self-organizing uh, happening this year in the Kerala floods. Um, so, uh, so lots and lots of people. Now, um, uh, what's interesting, kind of uh, vaguely academically to me, is um, the mo globally, the kind of way this is done is moved off platforms like Facebook and Twitter and other, like, other pl more public platforms onto things like WhatsApp. So the Kerala floods, huge amounts of citizen self-organizing, but not really done on the public web all done on interlocking WhatsApp groups. And that's interesting. Um, it's, uh, like it's, it's not because people um, have made a decision that they want to use WhatsApp above these other platforms. It's just they're on WhatsApp, their friends are on WhatsApp, that's what you do. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, so um, we also now, uh, so I just, I, I need to explain very briefly, even though I'm running out of time. Uh, so you know how it is, you have um, a set of slides that you've used a few times. This is the slide that I always use to talk about convergent volunteers. So this is the 20, 2014 floods in Somerset, but it's a picture of the prime minister of the time visiting. And I just couldn't put a picture of David Cameron up. I just couldn't do it. So I had to replace him with a penguin. Um, so. Um, what we have um, in the UK and around the world is this idea of convergent volunteers. So not just people getting online, people organizing online and then going to places. And this is such an um, issue. Uh, it's, it's of such significance that there's now UK government guidance to all the local public sector bodies about how you should think about convergent volunteers. So the Somerset floods, um, thousands, possibly tens of thousands of people turned up in Somerset, um, which is great, but it's not clear that um, they were necessarily very helpful. Um, but that's not necessarily, big. that might be because they were not directed to helpful things to do. Um, who's watching my time? I've got loads, all right. Um, so, uh, and then the third bit is, um, which I've kind of alluded to, is formal organizations of people who expect to be doing this stuff. Um, uh, I find there's a lot of friction um, as the, the internet changes the way that they think uh, stuff. So dramatic one that UK citizens may remember is um, 2011, we had riots in cities in England. Um, there were lots of causes for the riots, but one of the things that was very significant was people used uh, messaging platforms and social media platforms to organize, coordinate, to work out where the police were so they could go into other places. And the police did not expect that at all. They were not um, they were not geared up for that, even though it wasn't the first time it happened. They still uh, hadn't noticed. Um, 
And you're now, like, policing has attitude to uh, online social networking is completely transformed in the UK since then. So neighborhood policing is really emphasizes getting out into virtual communities because they don't want to be in the stage where people, are, citizens are kind of uh, organizing to riot and the police have no idea of what's going on. Um, um, and a significant uh, phenomenon that I guess has always been there with emergencies, but the internet puts it on um, uh, some sort of drug that accelerates things a lot. Speed I'm, um, uh, is rumors. So people, um, it's a weird phenomenon, um, but in a moment, is people kind of seed the internet with, with rumors, false rumors. And not, not usually, not with any, don't seem to have any sort of political agenda. That's just a, just a thing that people do. And often these rumors don't go anywhere, but sometimes the rumor will capture kind of a sense of where people are, and then it gets spread very widely, and it seems to cause a lot of unsettling. And this is, again, another example of the riots. So um, when the riots spread to the center of Birmingham, uh, someone tweeted a picture of this, which is, a, if you know the center of Birmingham, it's a huge metal bull outside the bull ring, which has had its head taken off by the rioters. And this went, this was incredibly widely shared and caused, I think, people to be very worried because it, it just sort of encapsulated this idea that the police had lost control of the streets. And yet, A, how would they get the head off a bronze statue? And B, um, it was, you could see from, the, if you knew anything about Birmingham, you could see from the, the um, shops behind that this was an old photo that had been photoshopped. And, and one of the interesting things is that the community in Birmingham, the online community in Birmingham, scotched that rumor very quickly, but the rumor kept coming back on an eight-hour cycle because people who were not online when the rumor was originally scotched logged on, saw the image, went, oh, my God. Um, and that, um, that is a, a thing that certainly in the UK, we don't really, we still, agencies don't know what to do about that. Do they leave it because the community will sort it out? Should they say it's not true? Um, five minutes. Okay, that's great. That's totally on plan. There's, there, there isn't half my presentation yet to go. Um, and, um, and just on the edge there, um, I'm really just sharing my pain. So I used to work for Heritage Council as a comms officer a few years ago. Someone returned from um, Sierra Leone, um, felt a bit ill, went into a GP walk-in clinic in the center of Hereford, um, and said, I've just come back from the Ebola area and I'm feeling ill, and, which he shouldn't have done. So that, so that person shouldn't have done that. They should have phoned up and said, I'm feeling a bit ill. Uh, but then the walk-in clinic didn't do what they should have done, which is say, go home and, uh, and phone us. They evacuated the walk-in clinic and put up a sign saying, it's just, and left, the, left this potential patient in there and put up a sign saying, suspected Ebola case. So it became quite a significant rumor. And the frustration for me was um, the public health people who knew what they were talking about were, were absolutely clear right from the start that there was very little chance that this was really Ebola, but they wouldn't say it because they have to go through a set of protocols, um, which is fine unless you live in Hereford when, when there's a sign outside the GP surgery going, Ebola has come to the... Um, and so this, this friction of um, the people who are supposed to look after you in emergencies interacting with what's really happening in emergencies is, is um, a, a kind of ongoing um, uh, problem. This, um, I will tell you very quickly. So um, one other thing we haven't really come to terms with is bad actors in these networks. So this was um, in 2011. Um, you may or may not remember that there was a NATO um, uh, bombing campaign in Libya. Um, uh, my volunteer group worked for the UN um, uh, privately to map what was going on and provide that information to the UN so that they could plan a humanitarian response afterwards. Um, it became clear very quickly that people sympathetic to the Gaddafi regime had infiltrated our network because we never gave any thought to operational security and in fact we still don't really know how to handle operational security and they were trying to manipulate the information that was on there and that was back in 2011 and that was before we knew about what Russia were up to and they, um, uh, we don't know how to deal with uh, kind of uh, bad actors trying to influence our normal discourse. We really don't know how to deal with it in an emergency or a disaster. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's an issue. That's, that's an example there. So how the Internet has changed emergencies. Um, maps are better and maps save lives. Maps are the thing. 
It's made communications infrastructure critical. It's enabled citizens to do things they never could before. Um, but we're, we're experiencing this friction with kind of established organizations and their normal way of working. And what could you do about it? If this has inspired you, if you ever, ever, ever do anything with geodata, do it with OSM. The more people work with OSM, the better OSM gets for the world. And a lot of the missing map stuff is relies on a, a thing that was developed in the UK for a completely different uh, um, purpose called, it's called the walking papers. And so we, if we develop things here, they can have unforeseen benefits around the world. If you have tech skills and you want to help out, join a DHN partner organization. And if you can work out how to fix Twitter and Facebook, that would be great. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Uh, that was an absolutely amazing talk. We have time for a few questions. Just stick your hand up if you do have questions, just so I can get a sense of how many we've got. OK, great. Hey, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Very interesting stuff. Um, there's been a couple of application built for Android and, and uh, iOS to kind of uh, supplement Google Maps for things like traffic and speed cameras and police, you know, all that fun stuff. Um, have you thought about maybe making uh, applications so, sort of like this for emergencies? Because then it would bring it down to sort of very low level that anybody could start using it and kind of feed into the system just by taking out your smartphone that you, you know, used to, to use. Um, is, is there some, something like that out there? Have you thought about this? Um, I think that sounds like a great idea. What has worked so far is where people build applications for their own purposes, but then open source them. So like Ushahidi is a, is a critical kind of tool for citizen self-organizing, but it wasn't built for that purpose. And so um, the, uh, the Birmingham, the Map of Mercia OpenStreetMap group is building exactly what you described. They're building kind of traffic data into OpenStreetMap in, in Birmingham. And I think we should focus on building applications that have a use now and let people who need them find, like, ha get hold of them when they need them, rather than trying to guess what application might be useful in the future, if that makes sense. What about emergencies like disasters? So, I, I, yeah, I guess. Yeah, what about uh, emergencies like disasters? And so I, I, I guess. My experience is um, in a disaster, people reach for the tools that they are familiar with and some tools that other people are familiar with. People, like they, people do try and build disaster-specific applications, but they often don't gain traction because in a disaster, you want the thing that you know how to use, not the thing that was designed for this purpose. So, repo, so, so I think we should build cool stuff, but not build it for emergencies, build it for use and make it available to people in the mountains. Thank you. Sorry, not so much of a question, but just a, a call out to um, Missing Maps that we hold mapathons regularly. Go to missingmaps.org and there'll be a mapathon in your area. Or there's, there's lots of them. I, I organize Reading Missing Maps and I'm involved with London Missing Maps as well. So Maybe Missing Maps could have a village at the next EMF. Wonderful idea. Any more questions? There's one over here. Hello. It's just interesting hearing about Aberystwyth since we were, me and uh, my friend were staying there at the time. But my question is, you mentioned these large, or large organizations which have like bureaucracy in place or process in place, which means they can't comment on like an Ebola thing. And then the small you know, people to people, like peer networks. Is there anything between them two kind of extremes or like a bridge of, you know, maybe knowledgeable people that could comment on the, uh, on the Ebola thing because they're not as constrained by process? Um, yeah, and in fact, uh, the, poli the police have cottoned onto that since the riot. So, um, so in, uh, in Herefordshire, in South Hereford, um, we had, um, a couple of years ago, um, a, 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 a set of stabbings in close proximity, which the police said were not related to. It was just a chance thing. Um, and, but the police now are smart enough to know that a, a statement from the superintendent won't go anywhere, but the neighborhood policing team putting something out on Twitter 
will get a lot of trust because everybody knows them already in that environment. And so the, it isn't that, so, so that's the, the message for, I think, for formal organizations is um, you need to join the network, like the world is not as you think it is, you need to join the network. And then um, that's, we need public health professionals in the network that people know and trust, that's. Fantastic, a huge round of applause for Ben.